Good morning interweb number one, this is unscripted and unrehearsed. Number two, you're going to need to watch the last video otherwise most of the questions will make no sense. Also I'm a little bit ill so heads up and apologies in advance. If a planet had a ring, how much do you think it would affect the tides? Not much at all really, rings are really tenuous, like Saturn's rings are something like 10 kilometers thick um, on average, which is like on the planetary scale like nothing. So things like solar tides and lunar tides will be the predominant forces in the region, the rings will be negligible. At 148, there is a huge tidal effect in the Bay of Biscay. There also seems to be larger effects on pretty much all western shores. How come? So remember I said that the wider the bucket, the greater the tides. Another way of looking at it would be the further a shoreline is from an amphidromic point, the larger the tidal range. And if you look at the amphidromic point in the Atlantic Ocean, you'll see that it lies closer to the US than it does to Europe. Ergo, the western shores of Europe experience disproportionately large tides. As for the large tides in general on western shores, I think you'll find that there's loads of quite large tidal ranges on eastern shores as well. It's all to do with local geography and distance from an amphidromic point. If a planet has an axis close to 180 degrees, then how does it experience high and low tides? So the difference between a planet with zero degrees of axial tilt and 180 degrees of axial tilt is that from the same reference frame, they both spin in opposite directions. So like if my finger here is spinning counterclockwise from the perspective of someone looking down on my finger and I rotate it 180 degrees, from that same perspective, it's now spinning clockwise, the reverse direction. So a planet with 180 degrees of axial tilt will experience the same tides, except it'll rotate through its tidal bulges in the opposite direction. But Edgar, what about habitable moons in a multi-moon system? Yeah, I was afraid someone would ask this. <laughs> Trying to work out the tides on a habitable moon in a multi-moon system is just super complex and kind of beyond my ability, or certainly beyond my ability to uh, refined down to basic mathematics. So in this case, I would look at hand-waving some things, but hand-waving things from a logical standpoint. So most multi-moon systems will orbit a gas giant, right? And gas giants are really big and really close to their moons. Ergo, they're gonna be the dominant player in the region in terms of tidal effect. So what we could do is treat the multi-moon system like a single moon system and just factor in solar tides and the planetary tides from the gas giant. Now, that is not correct, that is not accurate, it's expedient. And I think you need to be expedient in this case because of how complicated things can become. That said, if any of you do, if any of you do have a nice simple method for computing such a scenario, leave it in comments, I would be the first to want to see that. What's your IQ? I don't know, and I also kind of don't care um, I always thought, I, I know nothing about how the IQ system is done, but on the face of it, I always thought it was a silly sort of system. Like the idea of boiling down human intelligence into a single number is kind of odd to me. And I don't know how it interprets intelligence. Like there's many different types of human intelligence. Does it factor that in? And if not, why not? And why do we give certain intelligence priority over other intelligences. Also, I kind of dispute the idea that high intelligence is a thing that is sought after. Sure, it's great and we need high intelligence people in society, but like, I don't want to denigrate people who are say physically gifted, but not intellectually gifted. That's just a different gift, you know? Neither one is better or worse in my mind. What are the areas that creators overdo while world building? I guess this isn't wild world building, but once world building has been done, there is always this sort of urge to over explain your world building, like to show everyone just how much work you put into this setting. And uh, you gotta resist the temptation to do that. Unless you're Neil Stevenson, in which case, fire ahead. Always hide 90% of your world building is uh, my tip here. What are your thoughts on naturalistic conlang and the creation of a proto-language to create multiple related languages that sound nice together and are more accurate to how actual human languages work? I have mixed feelings about proto-languages. I think the construction of a proto-lang is a great idea if and only if you need to create a set of related languages. Otherwise, I don't see the point in creating a proto-language now, there's already a whole load of conlangers typing furiously telling me how wrong I am about this. 
And it, it worries me slightly because I see this sort of over fetishization of the proto lang in the con lang community. Like I see people leave comments advocating for the creation of, of proto langs in places where it's just, there's no point doing it. Like if you're going to create a single language, just create a single language. You don't need to have a proto language and then derive your language from that language. Oh, and I think this fetishization has come in part from Rosenfelder's language construction kit because he devotes an awful lot of time in the book talking about protolangs. And I think a lot of conlangers have just kind of taken that as, oh, I must um, care about protolangs as well, which I think is the wrong approach. And I would encourage people to think critically about when and when not to uh, bring out a protolang. Do you think world building or conlang should be part of people's assignments in school? I would go so far as to say that all of schooling should be based around world building. Now that is a Buzzfeed style assertion there, but hear me out. In our current system of schooling, or at least in the one in Ireland, um, you get to first year and you're told you must do subjects A, B, and C without any regard for what you, the pupil, like, what your interests are. And I think some Scandinavian countries, I can't remember which ones, uh, either proposed or demoed a system that turns that on its head. It, it asks, what does a student like and how can we teach that student uh, core topics through their interests? So if I were one of those students, I would be asked, what do you like doing? And I would say world building and conlang. And then the teacher would go, great, we're going to teach you physics through world building. We're going to teach you maths through world building. We're going to teach you earth sciences, uh, astrophysics. We're going to teach you linguistics through conlang. Uh, we're going to teach you social sciences, etc., etc., etc. And I think that's a much more, uh, I think it's a much more radical and also quite healthy educational system. I don't know if it works in practice, but in theory, it sounds good. So I think all education should be based around the person's interests. If your interests are world building, that should be the entirety of your education. I have a question about conlangs and colors. Where should one draw the line of where one color starts and one color stops? Should I randomly pick or is there a real reason? So you could totally randomly pick, that's entirely your prerogative. Uh, there does seem to be some sort of like universal way in which languages do deal with color. Vox did a video of this, so I won't repeat it here. It's in the description, go check it out. Edgar, what are your thoughts on artificial planets slash hollow planets? So years and years and years ago, I came across this really interesting post or comment, I can't remember, on the world building subreddit that asserted that if you had a flat earth that was infinite in all directions, so an infinite flat plane, and you stood on the surface of this structure, you wouldn't perceive it as like a big pancake sprawling out in front of you. Because of the way light would bend, you would perceive it as sort of a dome. And because it's infinite, that dome would close up, uh, but for a small infinitesimal uh, point at the very top, which kind of fried my brain. Now, if that's accurate physics, that's amazing because like an infinite flat plane is functionally a hollow planet. <laughs> Mind blown. If someone can find that comment or post for me, I would be very happy because I haven't been able to find it since. Maybe I made it up. Who knows? I think you said that an abugida is a consonant with additional characteristics of a vowel. Would it be possible to turn this upside down? You have a vowel with additional characteristics of a consonant. Uh, links in the description to abugidas for anyone who hasn't seen my videos on these. I would say that turning this idea on its head is kind of cumbersome and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like if we were to take English and abugida is it, which would you rather? 21 glyphs for consonants plus five diacritics for the vowels or five glyphs plus 21 diacritics? The latter seems crazy. And even if you had a language that had a huge amount of vowels, chances are it would also have a huge amount of consonants. In fact, I would make the assertion that maybe it always has more, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So yeah, I would say that the natural tendency would be to make the consonants glyphs and to make the vowels diacritics. But hey, it's a, it's a writing system. You can do whatever you want. What's your opinion on the Oxford comma? Strongly in favor. I see no reason not to do it, uh, but also I'm not a great person to ask because the Artifexian style guide is uh, weird in that there are Oxford commas. I also double space everything routinely. And I also put two spaces as in like two character spaces after 
uh, every full stop, which is uh, quite anachronistic and a bit weird. So I am not the right person to ask for opinions on punctuation. What is your opinion on the one biome planets that Star Wars, for example, loves so much? So people give one biome planets like a really hard time. And I don't understand this because we have examples of one biome planets in our solar system. Like Mars is a desert planet. Uh, a moon like Enceladus is like an ice world. So Tatooine, for example, is 100% legit. Now, in terms of life naturally evolving on it, we have, we have separate problems. But just the idea of a biome, one biome planets, is fine. So yeah, snow planets, legit. Desert planets, legit. Water worlds, also legit. Uh, where it starts to get a bit kind of like, mm, don't know about this, is like jungle planets and grass planets, because you, the world builder, are gonna to need to find some way of explaining to me how there is an e both an equatorial jungle and a polar jungle, and the same thing for grasslands. I would wager that you'd find it very hard to uh, explain that away. So yeah, some one biome planets make sense, some don't. What is the process you go through when making a video? So again, if by video you mean the regular animated videos, uh, it's usually about two weeks of research and scripting, then about two to three days to create the graphics, about a half a day to record audio, then one to two days uh, to animate the graphics in After Effects, about another half a working day to make the end vlog, and another half a day for like rendering and things like that. Then it goes into Patreon early release for a day. And during that day, I do things like thumbnails and metadata. So all in all, if my brain is like on full form and every, you know, the stars have aligned and there's a blue moon and all that sort of jazz, it takes about three weeks to make a video. But in reality, it's closer, maybe three and a half, four. Uh, which means that given that it's now the 11th, Yes, it's now the 11th of December, uh, so chances are I probably won't get a video out before Christmas. So I want to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Uh, look after yourselves, have a wonderful ending 2018. And I know I say this at the end of every video, but I genuinely mean it when I say thank you for watching. Um, the only reason I'm able to do this as my job, which is insane, is because you continue to watch. And that means um, a hell of a lot to me. Thank you to all the wonderful people who decided to go over to Patreon and to pledge whatever they could. It's, it's massive. It is absolutely massive to me. So you are all wonderful. You're all amazing. Have a great time. And I will see you hopefully before 2019, but more than likely in 2019. Until next time, Edgar out.